of course, that's what all good liberals do when they have a problem. They go to the government and they say, hey, if we make a big uh, cabinet uh, position or don't throw a bunch of money at this, we'll fix it. Government is there to be the solution. But that is not how this has played out. It, it, that's true. Uh, we need to also assign fault to all the Republican administrations that have uh, certainly not repealed uh, the U.S. Department of Education, but they've doubled down with things like No Child Left Behind and supported Common Core and all these centrally planned efforts to try and hack at the margins. Uh, there's the great quote from Henry David Thoreau, I think, where he says that for every thousand hacking at the branches of evil, there's only one striking at the root. And so for me, a lot of this is all these programs, all these reforms, all these things that we hear about about. They're all marginal. I mean, they're important. We should talk about them, but they're not really going to reform the core problem that we're seeing in the government schools. I think that core problem is that they're not facing substantial competition. And so costs go up, quality goes down. They have no incentive to really substantially improve, which is why I'm such a big proponent of what are called education savings accounts, where states can unlock those, those education dollars and allow them to follow the child to a private school, a micro school, a home school, something else, so that the government schools feel a little bit of heat and suddenly now have an incentive to improve to try and earn the customers that they want to keep rather than just assuming that they get to keep them all. Yeah, I really want to get into uh, how we solve this uh, here in a second. But let's go through a couple of the problems because you're really outlining a lot of the real problems with our education <laughs> system. And one of the things that the left says, the media says all the time, is that the problem is these are underfunded schools. There's not enough money going to these schools. If they had the money that they needed, we'd have much better performance. Uh, but, of course, what do, what do you libertarians and conservatives want to do? You want to cut these budgets. Do these schools have enough money? Well, if you look at the school districts that spend the most per student per year, it's, you know, liberal bastions like New York and New Jersey and D.C. and some of these places where they're spending about three times more than the national average uh, that everyone else is. And yet they're at the bottom of education proficiency. They're doing the worst. Uh, their Cato Institute and others over the years have clearly uh, done the research on the data showing that over the years as spending has gone up, educational attainment has been flat or is declining. So it's it's clearly the case that more money does not equal improved outcomes. I mean, talk to the average homeschooling family or you know folks at a micro school family, you can educate a child pretty affordably if you're doing it right, if you're incentivized to actually focus on the individuality of that child and build a curriculum that best supports them rather than throwing them all in this one size fits all system, where over the years, all, where I mean, all, where's all the funding going? That's what the you know people are always asking because teachers aren't being paid that much catching up with inflation. What we're seeing across the board is massive administrative bloat in the government schools where they're hiring all of these uh, non-teaching administrators, and that has significantly ballooned in the past few decades relative to student and teacher growth. So that's where we see a lot of the inefficiencies going, which means that this program, these schools have really turned into a jobs program for adults. It's why the teachers' unions you know, protect them so fiercely. It's not really about the kids. If it was, we'd get rid of a lot of the bloat and we'd focus on more efficiency. But so often we have these incumbents who want to now protect their turf, and that's what it's boiled down to. Mm, that's a huge, huge problem. Another thing the left uh, are constantly argues is that, you know, this idea that basically it takes a village, right? Like, the, you don't really have kids yourself. No one has kids yourself. You shouldn't be making those decisions. You need experts. You need uh, government officials to come in here and kind of guide you through this process. They're the experts, after all, Connor. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of that argument? Is there anything there? Oh, it boils my blood. Just the other day, the Biden Secretary of Education just came out and was saying, oh, for teachers, they know their kids better than anybody else. Uh, and his was a plea for, you know, teacher autonomy and, and not having legislatures dictate what teachers can do. But the mere fact that he calls them their kids, Biden has said this several times. He, When he talks to teacher groups, he says, they're your kids, they're your kids. They're not their kids. At best, these teachers are stewards of those children for a very limited period of time, but they're not their kids. And so often the left forgets that, uh, you know, the village is subservient to the family, not the family to the village. Yes, it does take a village. We're all in this together. We all need one another's help. Community institutions play a powerful role in the development of the child. But all of those things are supporting mechanisms to the core family. And it seems like the left and, and many beyond the left want to upend that societal model and place the state at the forefront and that the family should be subservient to the state. I think that's a horrible model. I think that's uh, 
uh, that is the path to tyranny. And sadly, that's the path that our public schools are structured to take us down towards. No, it really is amazing. Um, I want to give, play you this clip uh, from uh, from the governor of, uh, of North Carolina, Roy Cooper. Uh, he is... I mean, look, I think one of the big solutions here is school choice. I think it's really, really important. It's one of the most important things that's happening right now in the country. Uh, a real movement is happening. And honestly, we've been talking about this issue for so long, it never seemed like we'd get anywhere on it. All of a sudden, since COVID, we've really made real progress here. It's, in, it's been incredible. And of course, this is really threatening the teachers' unions. It's really threatening the politicians they've propped up over the years. To the point now where the governor of North Carolina is calling school choice a state emergency. This is incredible. Watch this. I'm declaring this state of emergency because you need to know what's happening. If you care about public schools in North Carolina, it's time to take immediate action and tell them to stop the damage that will set back our schools for a generation. Here's what's happening in the next few weeks. Their private school voucher scheme will pour your tax money into private schools that are unaccountable to the public and can decide which students they want to keep out. Oh, please. I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this segment. I, as someone who pays for private school, the fact that they're calling uh, my tax, I, I can't even get into it. I'm going to go crazy and we're not going to have enough time. <laughs> Connor, please insert some sanity into this moment. Well, I, uh, I've homeschooled my kids for a decade. Just this year, we also put them in a little private micro school. And it's, it's appalling to have to first pay taxes for everyone else's kids to a highly inefficient system. And then if I have money left over, I have the good fortune of being able to decide if I want to enroll my you know, children in a school or if I want to homeschool them. I think the governor is right. I think this is an emergency for their state. It's been an emergency for 40 years since <laughs> we were warned in 1983 that it was a rising tide of mediocrity. Now, he's looking at it from the perspective that this is an emergency for the teachers unions and the folks who are very protective of the inefficient status quo and have made a good living off of mediocre performance. Every monopolist hates competition. And so when you create a competitive environment where you're unlocking these education dollars and now they're flowing to other places, of course the monopolists consider that a crisis because for decades they have not had to earn their customers. They have haven't had to really work hard. They haven't had incentives. And now they're feeling the heat. So I think he's right to see that it's a crisis. It's just sad that he hasn't considered the past several decades the true crisis for how much our education system has been declining. And I think a bit of healthy competition is needed because, again, if this is about the kids, if this is ultimately about helping educate children, we got to do better. And nothing we've been doing has worked. It's amazing. I mean, he said he's acting like parents being able to choose where to educate their kids is like a hurricane. It's, it's a state of emergency. Right? It's like, <laughs> how is this possible? possible. Uh, Connor, before you go, what, what's the, give me a minute on like what the state of this movement is. I mean, we really have seen movement here. I, I was hoping we'd get this done in Texas. It doesn't look like it's going to happen just yet. What's the state of the school choice movement right now? Well, as you pointed out a moment ago, Stu, it's exploded post-COVID. Polling on this issue across the country has grown by 10% plus across every demographic. So many people saw during Zoom, all the Zoom schools and all the problems uh, that was happening during the pandemic, excuse me. And, and so polling has greatly increased. This has really turned into nationally a Republican-led effort, as is the case in North Carolina, where, as I understand it, the governor is going to get overridden in his veto because the Republicans are in control. So Republican legislators legislators are seeing this rightly as a winning issue as it comes to elections and campaigns. They're seeing that parents are demanding this. My own state in Utah, where I'm based out of, I run a think tank here, Libertas Institute. We got Utah to be the fourth state to have this program. A few others have followed. So I think this is the future. It is the future. I know the teachers unions are going to just be kicking and screaming all the way. They were in Utah. They did in every other state that have tried to pass these. But I'll give you this little, little vignette. When the teachers union in our state protested our bill that was creating one of these laws, these programs, there were about 200 people that showed up with all their posters and, you know, uh, shouting at the politicians and so forth. When we did a rally for parents and students and teachers to come out, we had 10 times the number. We filled the Capitol with over 2,000 people who showed up demanding this. So the parents are mobilized. They're angry. They're fed up with the mediocrity that we've had for decades. They're seeing that this is a winning message, a successful program. So I'm very optimistic that we're going to see these education spending 
account laws uh, proliferate across the, the country in the years to come. Mm -hmm. Thank God for that. Connor Boyack, president of the Libertas Institute and co-author of the brand new book, Mediocrity, 40 Ways Government Schools Are Failing Today's Students. You can pick it up wherever you get your books. Connor, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks, Stu.